Pokemon Red and Blue had 151 Pokemon, dozens of cities and hundreds of trainers, all in just one megabyte. That's more than a single photo on your phone. Today, I, the unemployed computer science student, am going to dig into the brief history and code wizardry that made it all happen. Picture this, it's the year 1990 in Tokyo, Japan. You're magically transported in the position of a Japanese engineer who just happens to be employed at a video game magazine during a game development company called Game Freak. Just six months ago, a revolutionary handheld console called The Game was released to the public and everyone and their moms wanted to play and make and own games for this thing. Some game titles were popular and the game were Tetris and Alley, which were simple games aimed at every age. Following the hype train, your now stupid boss Satoshi Tajiri wanted to make his childhood dream a reality and somehow managed to convince Nintendo higher-ups to make a fully open-world game including 151 monsters and a working battle system on the machine that runs Tetris. Suddenly it dawns on you that all that work falls to you and you start to weep. No worries, because the Japanese have already found a cure for stress at work centuries ago in the form of a practice called nomikai, which in English roughly translates to alcoholism. Now that you had the obligatory drinking session with your co-workers, and with the help of Sakyo drowned out all of your anxiety and other emotions, it's time for you to get to work. With your emotions deleted, your only problem now is actually fitting the game into such a small disk size. But no worries, because I'm going to explain all the core principles you need to know. The Game Boy Juby here is a state-of-the-art, never-seen-before video game hardware, back in 1989 that it is. Today, not so much. With an 8-bit processor, 8 kilobits of RAM and 1 megabit cartridge, GB today is like a dreary reactor with grandpa video game consoles more than anything. You want to know something funny? Do you know those musical greeting cards that annoying birthday card you on sent you to play crappy MIDI version of Happy Birthday is technically more powerful than the console that revolutionized gaming? So how is anyone able to fit so much content on a hardware equivalent to a glorified letter? Compression. That's right, it's the magical reduced all algorithm that saves you storage space and time daily. How does compression work? Let's talk about it. Firstly, there are two types of compression. Lossy compression or irreversible compression is primarily used for data that can handle losing some quality and still be usable like photographs or this video you're watching right now. And lossless compression, which is as the name says, reversible in use for data like text files, source code and also some image file formats like PNG. Obviously, we are interested in the latter, but there are countless lossless compression algorithms. The one we are interested in is called Run Length Encoding, or RLE for short. This algorithm was specifically needed for storing Pokemon's prior data. You see, RLE is particularly well suited for palette-based bitmap images which use relatively few colors, therefore perfect for Pokemon's prior data. Here is a simple implementation of RLE. Take the string of characters. An easier way to write the same data while saving space would look like this. Count the number of times the character is repeated, and after, we write the character in question. That's it. That's basically RLE. We store character once in the memory and then define how much times it repeats. Of course, this isn't the data Pokemon game works with, rather it's with a bit stream of ones and zeros. And instead of working with a single stream of data, every two bits are paired up for convenience reasons I'm going to explain in just a moment. But nevertheless, the principle stays the same. The thing you probably notice is that RLE compression works incredibly well with data that has a lot of repeated information, but it's kind of dog water when it comes to data where there's unique information one after another, like this. In some cases, the compression process might actually increase the file size rather than reducing it. But knowing these two inherent properties of the data we work with, there are two things we can do to make your compression more efficient. A. We can somehow increase the data that can be compressed. And B. We don't compress data that is inefficient for it. First, let's talk about scenario A. In order to make the compression more efficient, devs added a pre-processing step before actually compressing the data. This step is responsible for optimizing data, in this case increasing the number of zeros, using encoding methods like delta encoding or XOR operations. Take a look at this sprite. You'll notice there are four different colors used, which is the hardware limit of the Game Boy's monochrome four-shade palette. In order to store data of four colors in a single sprite, the base room will need to use two bits of data to represent one pixel, which is dumb and inefficient. So instead, the sprites are split into two bit planes, which both represent two different layers with two colors each. This allows each bit plane to use one bit to represent one pixel, and more importantly, it allows for delta encoding or XOR operations to take place, as both methods work with two bit values. These encoded sprites are then compressed using RLE if data is homogenous and then stored in memory like this. If you're wondering what magic is responsible for the original sprite rendering on the display from this heap of ones and zeros, the answer is just the same process in reverse. Data from each of the two bit planes is decompressed, decoded using the same method, and then merged. Now, I didn't find any information online about the merging process, but I can only assume it works by comparing pixels from one bit plane to another, and then based on the combination of two pixel colors, the final sprite is rendered, like this. You are probably thinking to yourself, I am so sure this is the right method, to which I have to say that I in fact wrote a Python script that merges these two bit planes together with these set rules, and I got the original sprite. So let this be a lesson that something f***ing around and finding out is faster than researching. Now that our compression is optimized to its full extent, we need to deal with the data that is inefficient to compress. We said the best option would be not to compress this data at all and leave it be. 
And we can achieve that by separating the data inside the bitstream with the concept called packets, namely hourly compression packets and regular data packets. You can think of digital packets as literal packets in which we store data instead of objects. And instead of addresses like on regular packets, we tell each digital packet whether the data should be compressed or not. Remember when I talk about how the bitstream is made up of paired up bits? This is the reason why. The combination of values in paired up bits define which packet will be used in the data. 00, zero represent RLE packets and 10, zero, zero, 01 and 11 one, one represent data packets. This greatly simplifies the whole process of determining whether the data should be compressed or not and it even allows for data packet starts and ends to be determined quite easily. Code just copies pairs of bits until 00, zero is reached. There is a lot more to this process, like determining the RLE packet sizes and how the coding methods and sprite sizes are predefined in the bitstream. But I think this is already a lot of information to process and I cover the most important parts. I leave some links to some explanations that go more in depth in the description. You also probably noticed that RLE is similar to another concept that is used in this game for saving memory space, tile-based graphics. The graphics rendering technique used for assembling the world map of Kento wasn't a new concept in game development at the time, but was a significant implementation that saved a staggering amount of data compared to storing the entire map as a single file. For those of you who don't know what the tile system is, back in the day a really simple way of saving storage space and achieving great results was saving texture data once in the memory and using a separate file to determine where each texture is to be placed. And the last thing I wanted to talk about in this video is sound design for these games. After image compression, audio takes up the most space, and I feel I should cover it briefly. The sound for Gen 1 of Pokemon was designed by Junichi Masuda, who was responsible for Pokemon Cries and opening theme which he made using an Amiga home computer. He used the Pro Tracker software that was an Amiga, which is a music creation software that stores music a sequence of musical instructions rather than audio files. Game Boy only had a 4-channel sound chip that synthesized sound using simple waveforms and the music had to be tailored around the hardware restraints, so he wrote his own code that converted these tracker compositions to the Game Boy-friendly format. Now, I don't have access to the original source code that they've used to assemble the ROM files, so I can't vouch for the details, but I do have the next best thing, which is the community disassembly of Pokemon Gen 1 games. And right here we can see how music was stored. We can see the tempo, volume, sound effects and even notes used to compose the music. Now, unlike MP3 or other music formats in order to play these notes, we need the sound engine, and Gen 1 had three of them, which mostly served the same purpose of actually playing these notes on the Game Boy 4 channel speakers. Though quality limited, these notes allowed for a lot of space to be saved in the ROM, compared to the alternative of storing songs as a whole separate files. This approach to music storage reveals the ingenuity and technical prowess of the Game Freak team. By cleverly manipulating the Game Boy's limited hardware capabilities, they managed to create not just functional but memorable musical experiences that would define a generation of gaming. It's a true testament to the technical skill and creative problem solving of the Game Freak team. They took a system that was technological equivalent of a birthday card and transformed it in a revolutionary gaming experience that would captivate players for generations to come. The fact they were able to achieve such impressive feat on a hardware that was already considered underpowered is truly remarkable and the true high point in the history of video game development. You're probably thinking to yourself, enough, oh Boris, you're glazing this game's way too much. You're driven by nostalgia. Well, newsflash for you, Airhead. I didn't play this game until last month and I loved it. I was in fact a PSP first console kid and I can confidently say that I would have loved having any Pokemon game on the PSP back in the day. And I feel like as great the PSP was, it never had the game as popular or immersive as the Pokemon franchise. Unlike some of the new quadruple A game titles that have a sole equivalent of a fluorescent lamp, you can actually feel the passion and creativity devs put into this game. Everything from dozens of easter eggs to the music and cozy art style make this game an absolute gem. There is a lot of stuff I skipped over, but I feel like it's way technical for this type of video and it will be way too much to cover. That and I was in fact way too lazy to edit all that. If you deem that I have made any mistakes in this video, don't tell me about it because I might just cry, but it's highly improbable as I never make mistakes. If you enjoy the video, consider compressing the like and subscribe button, and also I have a few other video game topics I plan to cover, so look out for that, and if you have some topics you want me to cover, leave them in the comment section.